You're excited because you know I'm the only thing standing between you and the bar, right? <laughs> so, why are we here? I obviously don't mean in this theater. I assume you're here to be inspired by brilliant speakers today. But I mean, why are we on this planet? What's the meaning of life? And so I figured, obviously, we're going to end with a light topic today. The meaning of life is something we're all going to question at some point, right? Why are we here? For me, it started when I was a dad. I think that from a young age, we're conditioned or brainwashed probably by advertising to think that the meaning of life is to find wealth. That somehow the scorecard or the validation for being a human being has to do with the car we drive, the house we live in, or the clothes we're wearing. I know you're all looking at me right now and thinking, based on my almost completely Target bot outfit, that guy's crazy successful. <laughs> but that's what we do. We judge each other. We judge each other based on the things that we just buy. In 1981, the movie The Cannonball Run came out. How many people have seen it? It changed my life. Let's, for those of you doing the math, let's assume I was an infant when I saw it. But in the opening scene, it had an amazing black Lamborghini, and I was obsessed. I have a six-foot picture of that Lamborghini that was on my bedroom wall until I went to college. And I told myself, if I do anything in this life, I'm going to own a Lamborghini before I die. That was my version of success. That was my only goal in life as a kid. From a young age, we're taught to start thinking about what we're going to do as a career or what our goal in life is. Probably in third grade, I think, and we start asking our children, what do you want to be when you grow up? And in my day, it was doctors and lawyers. If you asked my nine-year-old son today, he would tell you it's a YouTuber. <laughs> we spend the first third of our life educating ourselves and training for that job. Now, luckily, as kids, at least we take the time to make friends and enjoy life and you know, we have an imagination, we create things, we explore all the wonders of the world. But then as an adult, we'll spend the next two-thirds of our life living the same day over and over again. We'll get up in the morning and go to work if we're lucky enough to have a job. We'll work at least eight hours. Some of us will work more. We'll come home. We'll eat. We'll do some chores. If we're lucky, we'll spend some time with some people we love. If we're even luckier, we'll get to drive our kids from commitment to commitment before coming home, putting them in bed, going to sleep ourselves, and getting up the next day and doing the exact same thing over and over and over again. Because until you have kids, time really stands still. It's like life is on pause, and there's really no rush to the finish line. But once you have children... Life jumps in the warp speed. Before kids, you don't notice yourself aging. You don't really notice yourself gaining weight uh, when it happens pound by pound. You notice it in other people when you don't see them very often. But with kids, the change is quick and monumental. When I was in my 20s, 30s, uh, I really didn't notice a change in myself whatsoever. Those years for me... Um, it seemed like I had all the time in the world to accomplish whatever I wanted. But in the first 10 years that my kids were born, life went through in a blink of an eye. I feel like just yesterday, I was looking at my daughter in my arms, rocking her to sleep, as she's staring back up at me with this look that I can do no wrong. And then almost overnight, my daughter, who's now a preteen, Every single time, I'm pretty sure I'm being really cool. I, I get this, Dad, don't ever say that again. <laughs> so as I'm trying desperately to hold the hands of time and slow down life, watching my kids grow so quickly, I'm faced with my own mortality. And, you know, as kids, you don't have that issue. As kids, we're immortal. You figure you can jump off the roof of the garage holding nothing but a bed sheet and float safely to the ground. As adults, we try not to throw out our backs by getting out of bed too quickly in the morning. <laughs> and that mortality brings about the question, why are we here? What are we supposed to do with our lives? And if you want to put your life in perspective, imagine that you're on your deathbed. 
Imagine now, and not when it ultimately happens, that you have days or weeks or even months to live. What would you do with them? How would you fill that time? What would you change your life with? And what deal would you make with God? Because I can promise you none of you will beg him for more time at work or more money. What will be important for most will be more time with the people that you love. Maybe it'll be about the legacy that you leave behind. Because the meaning of life is not to be a consumer, although spending and acquisition is what rules most of our lives. I believe that we're all connected. <laughs> this is the theme for today. I think that we're all part of something bigger. I think that all living things share an energy and a spirit. And we're all unique parts of something bigger than ourselves, something bigger than the the sum of the parts. It's like the ants you heard about earlier today. You know, if you look at an ant colony moving, they move in unison, they move for the good of the colony. You don't see a single ant trying to go bring an apple back to the hive or the, the ant mound. You see all of them sort of marching together for their collective good. And I think the goal in life is to create harmony. I think when the world is out of balance, when we disrupt the yin and yang in things, we see the equal and opposite reactions. When we rape the planet, we see the effects on the environment. When we genetically engineer our food for profit, we see the effects on social health. And when we don't get along with people that are different than ourselves, we see war and death. I believe we're all given a God-given gift, a skill, a talent, and that that talent is supposed to complement somebody else's weakness. It's how we find harmony in the world. I think that for many of us, we go through life focused on our goals, our, our long-term vision of where we should be in life. And when we become parents, it's the first time in our lives we start thinking about the greater good because we're here to nurture and protect somebody else. We're here to raise our children. For me, uh, I spent about 20 years praying for, to be a dad. And it was a life-changing moment for me. And I fear about the people that are going to go ahead of me, the people that I'm going to lose. Uh, and as you've heard today from a lot of different speakers, being in the moment, capturing every moment that you spend with your family, with your kids, with those in the world around you, makes all the difference in the world. I realized that my God-given ability was to be a problem solver. That's my gift. Now, I'll tell you, if you talk to my wife, it's not a gift at all, <laughs> because I have an inability to just listen when she vents about a situation without offering a solution. And it turns out that there's a whole lot of guys that have this same gift. <laughs> so the challenge in life is to find yours. And as mundane as it might be, if your gift is simply that you're a good listener. You could put that gift to use to save people's lives. I promise you that money won't find happiness for you. That dollar bills can't fill the hole that a lack of purpose creates. And I say that again because I don't think any of us really live that life. We've gotten into this monetary trap. Money can't fill the hole that a lack of purpose creates. So find your purpose. And how do we do it? Well, there's a lot of ways. Have you ever gone to another city and you see a public work of art or an entertainment complex or maybe a great culinary district and you think, man, I wish they'd bring that back to our town. Well, guess what? You're they. We are all they. Stop waiting for somebody to come and create the next app or clean up your neighborhood or create opportunity for you. Stop being an armchair quarterback and just get in the game. Just do it. Another easy way to do it is how we spend our money. If people in Akron spent 10% of the money that they currently spend outside of Akron here, we'd raise $60 million for our local economy. $60 million is a game changer. That creates a lot of public art. That creates entertainment complexes. 
and that fixes all the potholes that we want to point our fingers at the government and complain because it's their responsibility to fix. Because shopping local isn't just a catchphrase, it's a way that we make a difference in our own economy. It's a way that we help support our neighbors, and it's the way we help the city provide the services that we expect from it. The other way is get connected. Find people that have skills that complement your weaknesses. Figure out what your problems are in your community and what the barrier to solve them is. Then get enough people that have enough skills to tackle it and never give up. My favorite quote is by Margaret Mead, who says, never underestimate the power of a few committed people to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever will. And I'll tell you right now, there's a large group of us, our society, the largest group ever, and millennials, they're at a pivotal point in their lives. They're about to decide on that one career path. And many of them will choose it based on their ability to get rich. And I beg you to think differently. Figure out what your passion is. Figure out how to make enough money to live a comfortable life, but then put your skill together for the better of the colony. We are the committed few. You are a game changer. And I'll tell you what, you've been on your biggest job interview since the day you were born. The position is human being. And I'm here to tell you, you all got the job. So go to work. Thank you. <laughs>